to the Sacco and Vanzetti opera that the White Barn is presenting this weekend. The story is intriguing and infinitely complex. I'll start at the beginning. Mark Blitzstein was born in Philadelphia in 1905. His grandfather and father were bankers and provided a privileged and cultivated environment. At three, Mark began to play the piano. At four, he took lessons. A few years later, he appeared in public and at 15, he concertized with the Philadelphia Orchestra. After two years at the University of Pennsylvania, he dropped out and enrolled at the Curtis Institute, the Philadelphia Conservatory, where John Carlo Minotti, Samuel Barber, and Leonard Bernstein later studied. In 1926, along with many American composers, Letstein went abroad. First, he worked with Nadia Boulanger in Paris, then with Arnold Schoenberg in Berlin. <coughs> at the end of the 1920s, the texture of his scores was dense. After the crash of 1929 and the overwhelming poverty that followed, many artists and intellectuals turned politically to the left. Blitzstein, because of his wealth, was able to travel extensively to Yugoslavia, Spain, and again France. Apparently trying to reconcile, in his head and heart, his growing Stalinist beliefs with his elitist compositional techniques he began work on an oratorio. The narrative was based on what happened to Sacco and Vanzetti, a fishmonger and a cobbler, Italian immigrants tried for robbery and murder in South Braintree, Massachusetts. Probably because they lied about their political convictions, they said they were not anarchists and they were. They were found guilty and executed in 1927. Blitzstein's choral work was first performed in 1933. Critics found that score too thick and the characters, quote, remote and inhuman. In March 1933, Blitzstein married Eva Goldbeck, a writer for the radical left, and began to write his own polemical essays, such as Coming, the Mass Audience. It was followed by a piece for piano and speaker, Send for the Militia. What I said, sort of parenthetically, which you may have missed, was that this was written in response to a revolt in Asturias that the Spanish government reacted to with bloody retribution. In 1935, he composed a song, The Nickel Under My Foot, and played it for Bertolt Brecht when Brecht visited his Greenwich Village apartment. Brecht suggested Blitzstein expand it into a full-length theater piece in which all forms of prostitution, not just the whore with a nickel under her foot, but politics, religion, business, and the press would be dissected and exposed. And so the Cradle of the Rock was born. During its composition, Goldbeck literally starved herself to death. I have no understanding of why she did this, but her husband attended her constantly, and after she died, worked obsessively and effectively <coughs> until Cradle was done. Celebrating the vernacular in both words and music, Blitzstein had erased Boulanger and Schoenberg from his musical vocabulary. The Cradle's premiere in 1937 was an astounding event. Tim Robbins recently recreated it in a feature film. The poet Archibald McLeish described it as the most exciting evening of theater this generation has known. Blitzstein had become a major cultural figure, working with John Houseman and Orson Welles, being celebrated in print by Virgil Thompson. In 1938, Blitzstein joined the Communist Party. There has always been a debate Art for art's sake, or art for a purpose. The first is Aristotelian, the second Platonic. Blitzstein adopted with passion the concept of art for social reasons and articulated that philosophy repeatedly in the libretto he wrote for Cradle. In supporting that point of view, he was not alone. This was the era of Robert Sherwood's Abe Lincoln in Illinois and John Steinbeck's Tortilla Flat as well as Ben Shahn's mural for a garment workers' resettlement project in Roosevelt, New Jersey. The Depression, the WPA, and the rapidly growing radio audience contributed to the burgeoning of accessible art and the de-emphasis of art for art's sake, the art that had developed from the turn of the century, most particularly 12-tone music, to the rise of Hitler, who did what he could to annihilate it. But after the end of World War II, artists once again turned to the abstract, Schoenberg and Stravinsky were living in California, Pierre Boulez was active in France, and Milton Babbitt prevailed at Princeton and Columbia Universities. 
1949, the year he left the Communist Party, Lidstein completed Regina, an opera based on Lillian Hellman's The Little Foxes. Although his choice of subject reveals Blitzstein's continuing hatred of the rich, the score exhibits a magnificent blend of the learned and the vernacular. After previews in Boston, it opened on Broadway, as, some had, as had some recently composed operas by Minotti. In 1958, the Ford Foundation gave money to the New York City Opera, then under the direction of Julius Rudell, and Regina was included. Brenda Lewis, an active member of this community, made that character her own in a performance that was stunning and memorable. We're very grateful to have her with us today. <laughs> I was out of Columbia's Graduate School of Music and the author of several small pieces that appeared in music magazines and was asked to supervise a teaching program there in which advanced music students could enter into dialogue with composers, librettists, stage directors, and so on. I invited Blitzstein to appear and we became friends. We lived one block apart in Greenwich Village. Soon after the American Opera Project ended, the Ford Foundation gave Blitzstein 15, a $15,000 grant, which was a great deal at that time, to compose an opera, and he returned to Sacco and Benzet. Rudell offered him a commission from the New York City Opera, but Blitzstein turned elsewhere. That was a bad choice. Why did he make it? By this time, he and Leonard Bernstein had become extremely close friends and colleagues. They met when Bernstein traveled to Harvard to attend a production of Cradle, presented under Bernstein, then in his senior year. That was 1939. He loved what he saw and heard, and the connection took off. In the 1940s, Bernstein, then conducting the City Center Symphony, presented Bernstein's Air. In the early 50s, he led Blitzstein's adaptation and translation of Brecht's Three Penny Opera at Brandeis. Blitzstein's version of the Kurt Weill work went on to become one of the most successful of all off-Broadway productions. As Blitzstein profited from Bernstein, the reverse was certainly true. Bernstein's work in music theater, in my mind, the best creative work he ever did, owes a profound debt to Blitzstein. It was Bernstein who seduced his friend away from the proletarian city opera and to the Met for Sacco. Throughout his life, the greatest joy for this amazing musician, Bernstein, was to make the establishment appear ridiculous. Think of the delight he felt imagining the unashamedly capitalist opera company investing serious money and then being stuck with an opera about two immigrant Italian anarchists. The story making the rounds at the time was that Rudolf Bing, then head of the Met, thought Sacco and Vanzetti were lovers. <laughs> right. But the end result was no joke. The disparity between subject and opera company surely played some role in paralyzing Blitzstein because he could not move ahead with his work. In the late fall of 1963, just before he was to leave for Martinique, we met on Lower Fifth Avenue. He told me he had just wired the Met, apologizing for yet another cancellation of a meeting in which he was to sing and play some excerpts from his score. He told the Met, and he told me, that he would work on it while he was in Martinique. But he had no plan to do that. What he did was put those fragments of Sacco they seemed to me, when I later looked at them, to constitute perhaps half of the piece, into the trunk of his Peugeot and drive to a friend in Westchester, where he would store his car while away. As far as I know, he told nobody of the location of what had to have become the most important effort of his life. He brought fragments of other theater pieces with him when he left New York. On January 21st, 1964, Mark went to a bar on Martinique and became embroiled in a fight with three Portuguese sailors who beat him so brutally he died the next day. I knew I needed to tell Blitzstein's story not only because I wanted to enhance his fame, but also because he seemed to me the perfect vehicle through which to explore relations between the United States and Europe, capitalism and communism, 12-tone writing and tonality, the then avant-garde and socialist realism, and the effect of those dichotomies had on one handsome, charming, witty, graceful, 
melodically inspired, permanently enraged American composer. That single article launched my career. It prompted Delacorte to commission my first book, the Sunday Times to ask me to write regularly, and the ASCAP Dean's Taylor Committee to give me its first award. Last month, the Music Critics Association asked me to deliver a talk to the members on how to write so the writing will sell. I used this piece to make some points. After I finished, Leonard Lehrman stood up at the back of the room and told me, and everyone else in the room, that the article, which he must have read when he was about 17, literally, 14? No, that's not possible. Literally changed his life. Later he called and invited me to do what I've done here. Now Mr. Lehrman can report what happened after a used car dealer opened the trunk of a Peugeot in the spring of 1964.